Well, let's uh, get started again. We talked about this high-tech biomechanical harvesting uh, system, and uh, I have seen uh, in some countries where what we believe to be um, out-of-date concepts operated at a very high level. Uh, I'll try to show you a part of that, but the, Swede, uh, the Finnish government uh, did a lot of its aid work in Africa, and what they did was import uh, systems for plantation management that were based on uh, manual and sometimes animal uh, power, uh, which was suitable for the people and their operations uh, in those countries. But instead of giving them a bunch of dull axes and saws that weren't sharp, they taught them saw doctoring and how to sharpen tools, how to work ergonomically, and how to be productive. And it made an effective system, at least up to a point, uh, for uh, utilization of these uh, of the human resources that were a part of that, including the animal resources. At the same time, I worked in Chile and found oxen uh, to be effective uh, uh, devices, uh, systems, for moving machines under away from a small tower. Uh, you can't justify having a machine there to do that. Uh, and the oxen are available readily. Uh, when they uh, uh, don't produce as much, you have stew. Uh, and uh, that's the way the system works. But it is a biomechanical system that has some high tech to it. You're all probably familiar with the motor manual systems of using a chainsaw to do felling, popping, delimiting, some kind of a skidder or maybe a forwarder to uh, transport uh, the logs chainsaw maybe at the landing if you didn't get all of the, the uh, limbs off and then a loader putting it on a log truck. That kind of is our base system from which we compare everything with because we have so much experience with it we know pretty precisely what the cost can be. But in the past uh, we had high tech biomechanical logging in the uh, felling techniques uh, uh, in the olden days with those cross cut saws uh, the uh, ability to bring down a six foot uh, Douglas fir, put it right where you wanted it, cut it up into lengths that could be uh, removed. Uh, sometimes the biomechanical part of it was to jack it up one end and then it'd have it slide 15 feet down the hill and uh, 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 then go down and jack it up again and then have it slide some more. I mean that was pretty biomechanical. In Asia they have a bunch of uh, uh, tracks in the forest that are like our skid trails that have uh, greased and uh, uh, slippery wood and they've got a bunch of people with headbands and ropes attached to the log. It's called kudu kudu logging and they pull it out by by their own physical human force. Uh, that's in like, like uh, uh, Vietnam uh, and in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, the, the, not in Thailand but further to the south in Burma and places like that. They don't do it much anymore, but it was... How a big a log can one guy? <laughs> it's, it's ten guys, and it's about four foot in diameter. You call it kudu kudu? Kudu kudu. So they had ten guys hooked up to that one four foot... Yeah, I, I have a picture of it. I, I just didn't stick it in the, in the slide here. Yeah. Amazing. Students. And even uh, even some of our uh, horse logging activities uh, today have some... Uh, high-tech biomechanical thinking to them. This particular horse right here taught uh, one of our, two of our forest engineering graduates how to log one summer. And uh, the horse was smarter than they were because uh, uh, when it would go down to the landing, it would stand under the shade. And uh, they all would put the landing in the wrong spot. If they'd have moved the landing 15 feet, the horse would have been happy. They could have uh, uh, got their job done. But, so even oxen, uh, are still used around uh, around parts of the world. Uh, a guy up in Maine that has a bull moose. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't heard that. That's amazing. I'll have to bring a picture. Of that would be great. Pictures. That would be great. Yeah, I haven't seen anything like that. <laughs> well, this uh, motor manual system, the motor manual systems that we are uh, are dealing with, are uh, fairly common, but there are quite a bit of variations uh, to it. Uh, skitter crawler operations. Some areas we do tree uh, length uh, operations. Uh, others are log length, and sometimes the felling uh, gets to be a little uh, a little more unusual in other places. 
the one that uh, has uh, gotten more interest more most recently is the log link system in which the trees are cut uh, maybe with a feller buncher uh, they're uh, moved to a landing by way of various means uh, I'll talk more about shovel logging and cable logging a little later but uh, then at the landing they're processed uh, into lengths uh, cross cut put on the loader or loaded and on the log truck and haul we also have a cut to length system which uh, may have a harvester uh, cut the trees uh, cross cut them and delimb them uh, top them and then uh, place them in piles that a forwarder could take out of the woods then typically uh, they go to a uh, another loader will come in and load them either on a log truck or in some cases we have uh, had set out uh, trailers that the forwarder would load the trailer directly and the truck uh, would move the machines away uh, people have kind of gone away from that because of the time it takes away from the forwarding activity and so they have had uh, sometimes even had a lower cost loader just to put the logs from where the forwarder dumps them onto the, uh, to the set out box and then more recently uh, the concept of a harwarder has been put into place and this is a combination machine that does the felling and then puts it in the bunk on its uh, back and then moves it uh, to the landing where eventually a loader may put it on a log truck. That system is uh, typical. Here's a feller buncher system with a couple of different types of feller bunching uh, machines. The uh, felling machines that can use a circular saw head sometimes operate on very steep slopes, uh, get the trees on the ground, and then uh, a forwarder may come in. This happens to be a uh, uh, clam bunk forwarder where the grapples are inverted and they haul them out in tree length operations to a landing uh, where, uh, where they are uh, uh, processed maybe by a stroke delimmer and then loaded on a truck in long log lengths. A forwarder is basically like a shovel that has jaws? Well a forwarder allows you to pick up the load and put it on the machine and you can either carry like in this one the whole log free and it just has the grapple so that it can load itself. In, on a, where you carry the whole the logs off there, you typically have shorter logs. The clam bunk uh, uh, forwarders take whole trees and they drag the top ends of the logs. But the loads are usually considerably higher than what you have with a regular forwarder. We have a felling machine that has a head that we'll see in greater detail that cuts the tree, delimbs the tree, cuts the tree to to prescribe links and then these are in piles that this kind of a machine a forwarder would pick up. So that's using our feller buncher and our forwarder system. Where we have our harvester and forwarder, uh, we'll pick up the trees with the harvester, process them in the woods, and then just carry them out completely with the forwarder. And this is what's typically known as the cut the link system. We'll talk about carriers in a bit, but you can either have wheeled carriers or track carriers for these uh, for these vehicles. And here is the harwarder uh, concept in at work, in which the same machine um, cuts the trees. And in the earlier models, the bunks were not on a swiveling uh, mechanism, but were static, and that was a little bit harder to work with. Now, if you notice, these bunks are at kind of odd angles at the uh, point where they're processing the wood. And this is off-centered at an angle. That allows the processing to fit the bunks. When they go to travel, they'll realign the bunks uh, in alignment, and it'll just travel as a regular forwarder. But the concept of aligning the bunks to the trees uh, was a more recent innovation for the harwarder. Harwarders have some interesting economics that we'll talk about, but it's the concept of a single operator and a single machine. Of course, when the head is down, the forwarding is down and everything is down. So there is part of our answer to, to think about. Have you seen the harwarder operators in the States yet? Not as yet. I, I think they have had one uh, in northern Michigan because that's where the Valmet uh, facilities are, but I have not seen it operate. I've seen it operate in trade shows in, in Europe. And it's, it's fairly functional, but it's not real fast. You know, so uh, 
again, you're spending the, the time of the felling machine placing the uh, wood into the bunks. And if you've got a lot of that to do, uh, you're taking a fairly expensive machine to do what a less expensive machine might do. And I'll show you the economics of it. Well, that was a log length system. We have uh, tree length systems that we've talked about as well, where we'll have a feller buncher, for example, cut the tree, and then by some mechanism bring it into a landing where it's processed, and then, then again on a loader or a log truck, or it may go through some kind of a processor that would allow you to blow the chips or the uh, energy wood directly into a van. So tree length operations uh, uh, are functional that way as well. We have full tree systems that you see here uh, that give you the notion uh, that you can cut the, the whole tree, and I'm talking just about the above ground portion of it now, and then you carry out those operations and may, they may go into a van uh, as well through some kind of a chipper operation. When I talk about just the above ground portion, I'm referring to the fact that we don't use much uh, of the uh, stumps uh, uh, here, but as an example, we have a, a uh, hybrid poplar plantation along the Columbia River where we actually pull the stumps and the stumps then are loaded and go into a, uh, a hog fuel uh, component uh, as well because uh, they don't want the uh, stumps in the ground uh, for sprouting. How much root is with that? Well, for that it runs about four and a half feet and it's about this big and tapers down. Uh, other trees, of course, don't have it. We had extensive systems in the southeastern U.S. for uh, full tree harvesting where the uh, uh, below ground pitch, uh, pitchy stumps would be processed into chemicals. And that has just about gone away because they're much more effective petrochemicals for the same, same purposes. But there's still a, a value there uh, underground that uh, was recognized at least at one point. These tree length examples uh, cut the trees on the slope, uh, move them across the slope with some kind of a harvest or a forwarder down to a processor and notice this one has a bin where he's dumping the tops right in the bin uh, as he's taking the tops and that'll go for energy or it could go to some kind of a uh, processor where we're producing hog fuel or, or trying to clean, do clean chips or whatever. Skidders uh, are able to do that. Different kinds of uh, felling uh, devices uh, can work. So we, we can do whole trees of different sizes as well. Part of the work in the Nordic countries that allow them to uh, deal with biomass is that they're working with very short trees. And uh, that really makes a difference because the trees here in Western North America are about 40% taller than any of the trees that you find in the uh, Nordic countries of the same diameter. And so there are some, some differences. Tree length examples uh, uh, come in uh, by even with cable systems processed at the landing, loaded onto trucks. Uh, tree length systems processed uh, by hand uh, or a stroke delimmer, and then some kind of a, a system for producing uh, chips and or other residual material. And then hauled off to a, a distribution point. So when we're thinking about these systems, it's pretty open and flexible how we can, uh, how we can uh, put the combinations together. Depending upon our markets, you know, you've got to have a market for the stuff. Why collect all the stuff in bins if you're going to end up dumping it uh, somewhere uh, uh, at a central place and then not ending up really using it? And that, that's happened in some cases as well. Biomass is, is one of the things that, that is of, of high interest for a system. Uh, here we have lots of uh, uh, feller bunchers uh, that can be used to separate the, the uh, solid wood component of it. And you notice this is a smaller machine. Uh, it's a four-wheel uh, harvester. And most of the harvesters that you've seen in the U.S. are uh, six-wheel harvesters. Uh, why, why do you think that is? What's that? Compaction? No, not so much that. No, we've got uh, we've got the uh, wood that would handle it, you know, either way. The answer is they don't trust us. I, by that I mean the equipment manufacturers. These things have been around for 25 years, but the first few machines that they brought to the United States and we used them, they were destroyed within a matter of months. 
And so when the cut to length system and concept was introduced in the US, they put in their beefiest and most robust uh, systems because they didn't feel like the operators would, would be gentle enough to the machines to where they could, could stay working long enough to prove that they were valuable. <laughs> so, so now we're just starting to see some of these smaller machines come into the US. And it was a conscious decision. I talked to the vice president for Timberjack, and he said, uh, I said, why aren't you putting in some of these small machines? We have forest areas that would like that. And he said, we just can't do it. We just take such a beating in our warranty work and our, our cost. Uh, people get out there, and the first thing they do is they find that it works in timber this size, so they drain in and put it in timber this size. And it's, it's not suited for that. So uh, that's the real answer. In this uh, biomass uh, concept, one of the interesting things is uh, the notion of bundling, where we'll take the, the slash material, wrap it with some twine, put it in, in uh, a bundle, uh, store it, uh, and especially store it out in the field uh, rather than bringing it to town, and then haul it to town when we need it. Now this bundling concept got a lot of play a few years ago as an idea, but it has its limitations and people don't seem to really understand where the concept got its real origins. In the Nordic countries, many of the towns have heating plants that supply steam for very concentrated areas. These heating plants oftentimes would burn biomass uh, as part of their, their furnish, but they have such small areas there for uh, the biomass uh, storage that they couldn't store enough in the winter time to be able to uh, to uh, have a good flow of energy to the town. So they'd run out of biomass. When they try to get it out in the woods, uh, even if they just stockpiled it loose out there, it would be so frozen and so tied together that they couldn't handle it. So they came up with the idea of the bundler uh, to store it. And out in Sweden in the winter time, you'll see biomass bundles stacked along the roadways of the forest operations area waiting for the uh, inventory control of the town to need those bundles. Well, that isn't the same kind of thing we're talking about in our system for biomass at all. And so they are willing to pay this extra cost to bundle it for that particular use. And that's why, as a technology, it's a system. But it may not be the ultimate system for doing biomass. Maybe we're better off doing the chipping or other handling processes that we're doing. We shouldn't, and, and the point that I'm saying about bundling, is that we shouldn't just grab a technology from someplace else and think that we can apply it here in our, in our circumstances directly. The thing about systems that I think is, is important is that you've got lots of combinations of motor manual uh, systems. It depends on where you're going to delim and cross cut. Uh, if you're going to delim and cross cut at the landing, you're going to have big piles really big piles sometimes. So that's a decision point of what you're going to do with them afterwards. If you're going to delim and cross cut in the woods, you've got it dispersed, but you may have a slash problem there for fire in that case. So you may have to treat it there. We are very much dependent upon tree sizes and slopes. Those are the almost the two factors that govern our mechanization options. In the Nordic countries, for the last 200 years, uh, except for southern hardwoods in southern Sweden and Norway, the biggest trees get about this big. And that's it. They've been working with that wood this size uh, for a couple of hundred years. And this, uh, this uh, concept is important because they have evolved systems. They tried stroke delimit as an example and found out that it took landings that were much bigger than what they were willing to, uh, to use. So they have had to go uh, from this size down to biomass size material is their range of development. We went from this size you know, to this size in the Pacific Northwest for our development. So it's a different kind of trajectory that we've been on. There are always questions about single versus multifunction machines. The more uh, functions we have on the machine, the less power plant that we have to have to do the functions. But at the same time, we sometimes to put in, um, we have less than efficient operations for each individual function. We have to make uh, decisions on the, the slash handling or biomass, as I mentioned earlier, and it always depends on the value of the products or sometimes the attached material. If we're going to do biomass, if we can 
keep it hung on to something worth, worth some value, we can probably make a system work. But to go out and do biomass alone may not be the, the uh, way we can make it uh, economically, economically feasible. Well, that's uh, a little bit on the different types of systems that we're talking about. And it's, you know, you sort up to your own imagination of how you can make them work. I'll talk more about uh, some particular types of deviations from those general categories that we've had so far uh, when we go further down the line and talk about uh, other machines. But all of these harvesting systems are dependent upon the machines themselves. And that's what I'd like to talk about now is the machines used uh, for all of these mechanized harvesting. It depends on the felling uh, techniques that we use, uh, the actual mechanisms, how the machines travel over the land, and the uh, uh, transporting of the load, whether we're taking individual trees or whether we're taking uh, uh, collected stems, whether we process at the landing, and even how we do uh, loading and hauling. And in some cases, there has been efficiencies by having another step in the process by having some kind of a, a materials handling yard, a sort yard, or a surge yard, or sometimes we've used it as a means to change the transportation method, going from, from uh, long logs to uh, uh, logs that can be put on a train. Those options may come into play as well. So let's talk about felling machines. And, uh, there we start out by looking at the cutting heads and uh, we first of all try to make the distinction, and this is uh, page 15, uh, behind page 15, page maybe page uh, 16, it's got that uh, uh, located if you can, can't read it on your, uh, on your uh, individual slide. We make the distinction first whether we're going to, to do a full processing by harvesting or whether we're just going to cut the tree. And for a long time we had uh, shears that uh, were effective uh, felling uh, devices. We had hydraulic cylinders and different types of shears that would just come together and cut the tree off by shearing. Mills found that about up to at least 8 to 10 inches, and sometimes as high as about 16 inches, the damage to the wood fibers was sufficient to where they would prefer it not to be sheared. Now, that changed us to different types of felling heads uh, that we looked at, the non-shear approaches, but in point of fact, for simplicity and for the benefits of uh, shearing, we shouldn't discard that concept. Uh, it's a little slower than a saw, but it doesn't have some of the attributes uh, that saws have, and it still has a, a place to play. When we so are talking primarily in smaller material, then that you wouldn't get the damage uh, with the shears. With shear. I think you get the damage on almost everything from shears. We tried cup shears and stuff like that. Uh, we tried uh, shears that were offset, uh, but still there was such tremendous force uh, that the, the fibers were were damaged. But in terms of the shears, they don't have a lot of moving parts. And we'll see about some of the hazards of thrown objects in a minute, uh, or a little later, that tell us uh, some of the difficulties. The non-shears generally uh, involve some kind of a disc action, where we have a rotating disc with teeth on it, and or else we use some kind of a bar uh, and chain that cuts the material. There are two others that are not shown on this because they were tried and kind of discarded. In Canada, they had an auger uh, that was uh, sharpened. And the auger would come up to the tree and auger its way uh, through the tree. And this was found to be especially effective in, uh, in a frozen wood, where the trees themselves were so frozen that it was very hard on the teeth to cut it. And uh, oftentimes, uh, the quick action of a saw would cause the tree to split. And so the, uh, the uh, auger had a short uh, life in, in that part of the world as a solution. The other approach was a, a very large circular bowl that was on a spiral. And the spiral of the bowl would come around 
and it would cut the uh, tree off. So that each time it turned a little further, it would take a bigger bite. Uh, that turned out to be just too slow. So the cutting heads are either the non-shear or disc or chain and bar that we're left, sort of left with. Uh, uh, so the disc? Yes, it can be a disc saw, and it can have uh, a couple of ways that they operate. One is a continuous saw in which you have about a 550-pound disc with teeth about two and a quarter inches in height that travel about 1,100 RPMs. And the amount of energy in that rotating disc is enormous. And that disc will come into a tree, and it will cut the tree off just by the inertia of the disc. There won't be any more power applied to the rotating disc while the disc is cutting the tree. Then uh, that uh, rotating disc then cuts the tree off. Then when it comes out of the tree, the uh, hydraulic uh, motors speed up again and bring it back up to speed and you go to the next tree for cutting. Then you have intermittent uh, uh, saws that are, are discs that are, that are only powered when you go into the tree. And they have power to them as you're cutting. When you remove them from the cutting, they're not powered and they stop. So that's the difference between the discs. The chain only goes when you're cutting. You start the chain up to speed and you cut as you're, uh, just like a chainsaw, you rev the engine and you cut. And getting back to the auger, it's basically a big drill bit that's a larger diameter. Than yeah, it was, about, it was about, well those are tech Canadian trees, they were about this diameter, the auger was about this big. <laughs> And it would just come into the tree and auger it, auger it off. And the, there was a plate above it so that when it augered, the tree would sit up on the plate mm -hmm. and it would just uh, just uh, sit there. And it, the trees didn't split. They did it a lot for the uh, higher value material in the frozen. Some operators don't play that really the cone saw. Uh-huh. But they said they, can't, they just came there. No, no. That, that, you know, that's a good point, Darren. One of the things about all of our mechanized harvesting equipment uh, it's a point that I'll make up with uh, the Winthrow grapple. Uh, there wasn't enough demand for it, and so you can't find some of the equipment. You have to have enough demand for this material, for these techniques and technologies, so that you have a infrastructure to support it. The greatest idea, you know, one-off, uh, might work, but you can't get parts for it. Our harvesters can either be single-grip harvesters, and these are the ones that grab the tree, cut it off process it, the whole thing, and all with the same head. We also had, uh, for a time, in the Nordic countries, double grip harvesters. And that was usually for bigger trees, where you cut the tree off, laid it in a tray or between some uh, uh, drive wheels, and that processed it. And it processed it automatically. You could then be cutting another tree while the one was being processed. Those are the concept of the harvesting heads that we were looking at. Well, let's look at some of them. Uh, the chainsaw uh, is uh, uh, what you see uh, here and uh, you see uh, here. Uh, this is a shear uh, cutting off a pine tree in uh, eastern Oregon. Uh, for that kind of thinning, they were just uh, producing pulp and you know, wood quality wasn't, uh, wasn't an issue. This is a circular saw felling head uh, that one is, in particular is uh, continuous, and so once it gets revved up, you go in and cut the tree off and uh, kick it over uh, to another, another uh, position. This is on the back of a trailer, a very small uh, one grip harvesting head, and it just goes and cuts the tree off and processes it, uh, uh, and it'll handle up to about uh, maybe 14 inches. Come in all sizes. As I said before, the, the Nordic countries that developed a lot of this equipment don't have trees bigger than this. So all of it is scheduled for that. Oftentimes it's scheduled for the, for the most likely tree size. So if this is their biggest, a lot of the equipment is designed from trees about like this. So that may tell you something about why we have to do some things differently when we adapt the technology, because it's not been a, developed exactly for conditions here. This is a, or a, a, a saw head, and all we have is a hydraulic motor that brings the saw out and cuts off the, uh, off the trees. It's not a, a, not a lot of uh, grain split. The other part is how we, uh, how we handle the attachments and, and move the, uh, the machines in the woods. And 
we break that down into a couple of different categories depending on whether or not there is a boom that reaches and grabs or swings the, the material or whether it's fixed to the front <coughs> of the machine. If it's fixed to the front of the machine, uh, we can have that uh, felling operation and processing operation on a tracked crawler or a rubber tired crawler. And we further break that down because there have been lots of uh, developments in parts of the world where this little three-wheel machine has been used. And this little three-wheel machine is just two big hydraulic motors attached to two great big wheels and then a dead wheel in the back that just sits on a spindle and turns whichever way. And that uh, little three-wheel has been developed in uh, South Africa. Uh, it was used initially for handling of the gas in their... Uh, 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 sugar plantations. They ad adapted it to uh, harvesting operations and thousands have been sold all around the world. It's one of the worst machines ever designed for human use. Uh, it serves a purpose, but I'll show you how, how difficult it is to, uh, to work with that machine. If we have it on rubber and we can take uh, that uh, rubber machine, sometimes we'll put it on the front end of a uh, front end loader. And in fact, one of the more effective ones is where we took a skitter, turned it around backwards, put the cab on backwards, and put the felling head on the back of the skitter, and use that as our platform to drive from tree to tree. If we have the swing boom, uh, again, we break a, a distinction down between those that are just felling the tree um, and uh, dumping it for later handling. Uh, and there we have a tracked excavator uh, type and the walking machine. Some of you saw the walking machine in this little vignette that I had in the, the thing. I'll show you a little more if you're, if you're so inclined. Uh, and we have a uh, uh, rubber tired uh, machines that have booms that can, can uh, reach. If we're going to do harvesting activities, the same general categories apply. And what they I just identify there is that if you're on a uh, rubber tired skitter, you could have a single grip harvester or a double grip harvester that I mentioned from the harvesting end. So that kind of breaks it out for us. Each one of these combinatorial things has different characteristics and effectiveness for what you're going to use. And so you might find on gentle terrain, somebody who's got a rubber tired front end uh, a felling uh, head that's able to work very effectively with a grapple skitter that's going directly to a chipper. And all sorts of uh, combinations can work uh, as well. It's not necessary to have the most expensive equipment to have the most effective outcome. Well, these felling machine uh, technologies that we've seen, uh, and this is this little three-wheeled uh, uh, felling machine with the, with the uh, big tires, the dead wheel, and it just drives up to the tree, cuts it off, and uh, uh, kicks it off into a pile. And the operator sits right in here. He's protected by a bunch of uh, bars and screens there, a bunch of bars and screens there, and he can't see behind him where sour apples. And so you always want to approach this guy from some place near the front because he'll run over you in a heartbeat and he'll run over trees as well in a heartbeat. The first time we had one of these things in a demonstration probably 20 years ago, they were cutting an alder tree and they came up to a fork in the alder tree so they couldn't cut it below the fork. So this thing has on a little boom, he raised it up about three feet in the air above the fork and cut the alder tree off, promptly flopped over. And the announcer said, and this, ladies and gentlemen, is the bottom of the machine. We'd like to show you how it looks uh, uh, from that. Uh, and they let go of the alder and popped it back up, let the fluid settle, and started back up again. But, uh, not real, not real uh, safe under that condition. In the tracked uh, feller bunchers, we have tracked feller bunchers that will do self-leveling. So we can level the cab on the track feller bunchers and operate on slopes up to 60% or so. You can't pick up the tree and swing it around uh, and drop it behind you at 60% slope. So I'll show you what happens when you try that. 
uh, but you can work about a 30 degree angle out in front of you, cut the trees, kick them off to the side, and operate on slopes that's deeper. Uh, these machines are, are fairly common. Uh, you can see uh, this particular uh, machine with the lights on is rubber mounted, but if you look at this area right here, this uh, hydraulic motor is on an arm, and the arm is about two feet uh, long. So the arm can move up and down, and so you can move up, way, up this way for one, this way with another, and you can level on that machine up on about a 30% slope if you need to just by the arms of the, uh, of the uh, wheels. They're on, the hydraulic is sprung on, on arms. Uh, this particular one is on pretty much flat ground. I'll show you one that has a characteristic that will widen from 12 feet in width for big timber to narrow to 8 feet for tight thinning so it can move the wheels in and out. And by the night lights, you see they're extremely bright. Uh, they do operate these uh, uh, three shifts in some places. Two shifts is more common, however, and, but it is operating during darkness. In the Nordic countries, it's dark uh, from about uh, 2.30 uh, till about uh, 9.30 uh, for about uh, four or five months of the year, depending on how high you're up. This is an example of the double grip uh, harvester. You can see cutting the tree here, it's placed in the cutting and processing heads here and these drive wheels then uh, set it up so that it's measured. There's a computer on board and as soon as the uh, harvester sets it in the, uh, in the tray, the arms uh, grab it, it's started to measure and then it's processed by the computer on board so that it's producing saw logs, uh, shift pulp wood and then it will uh, kick the top out uh, uh, as well. So that two grip harvester was used early on in development for bigger wood. Later on they developed much bigger single grip machines that carried out the same function just plain faster. Do you have to have pretty homogeneous stamps that used to work? Do you have a variety of sizes that used to change this table? Up to a point, uh, but again if you have a machine that's designed for a diameter like this and you are doing a bunch of trees like this, it's not very efficient. If you're harvesting designed for this diameter and you got 30% of them that are this diameter, what you have to do is to go in on one side, cut a, uh, a uh, half a tree on one side, position the head around and cut it from the other side and then you may not be able to process it. You may just be able to fell it. Then you may have to begin processing somewhere where you can, where you can process it. So the efficiency comes into play as well. On that other one with that double bit, uh, does the log, after it's been processed, just drop to the ground? No, uh, that machine uh, pivots it for each tree. When you come to a point and stop, it will it will set the saw logs up as being the first cut. So the, the wood that goes out that direction uh, will be saw logs. As soon as it gets to a diameter that it becomes pulp wood, it'll shift and pivot and it'll pitch the stuff out this direction in this pile, which is the pulpwood pile. And then there may be even be another pile for biomass or really small wood, and it'll pitch it. So this head right here, or I could better off right here where it's showing a cut, pivots and places the wood into the piles. The forwarder operator is the one who really has to, uh, has to put the logs into the proper sorts. But uh, this machine gets them there you know, pretty well. So it just kind of spews it out. It doesn't lift it up. No, it no, it drives it out. Those drive wheels. In fact, that was one of the other reasons that they that they uh, went to the single grip harvesters. That sometimes the drive wheels on these double grips were pretty aggressive, and you'd suffer suffer some damage to saw timber. Uh, you know, for the outer. So outer did they take two operators? No, one operator did it. But I'm assuming that the operators primarily going after the tree cutting it and once it gets into the, the second grip then that's done pretty much by computer. By computer. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll talk more about the, what the computer, how it decides what kinds of wood it is but these computers have been fairly sophisticated. Early ones were just a matter of size, you know. Now they're a matter of grade, you know, and well there's, there's other things that come into play there.
we're talking about machine travel, we're also talking about the wheels themselves and the wheel surface interface is really critical uh, because the, the machines are fairly heavy and if we have a lot of power on a heavy vehicle, we can very quickly exceed the soil strength. And you can only propel anything, even your car, as strong as what the soil strength is underneath you. And so we try to have the wheels set independently so that they can assess the amount of slip in each wheel or each axle so that we don't try to drive them past the uh, soil strength. And so sometimes instead of moving fast, you'll end up moving slower uh, because of the soil strength. And these uh, wheels are set on hydraulic motors that are sensitive to not allowing too much slip. And it'll also take into account the differential slip. In our vehicles, we have limited slip differentials that we have on pickups and stuff. Had them for years so that you could, uh, you could get better traction uh, when you had different conditions. These are on each individual wheel, at least one wheel in the bogey. On tracks, we've had torsion suspension vehicles for a long time, military design in the Vietnam War, uh, before the Vietnam War, that provides uh, more contact area uh, in to the ground surface because each wheel is on a torsion bar. And so the track stays in contact with the unevenness of the terrain as opposed to a fixed rail on a typical crawler tractor. So if you watch these things, the, the best thing is the analogy of going over a, a log. The torsion suspension vehicle will go over the log and it'll kind of snake over it. You'll see it bump up in the middle and then it'll go on it. When the crawler tractor goes on the log, it goes up like this and then it flops back down and goes across it. That difference in tractive energy allows this uh, torsion vehicle to travel on slopes up to 70% where this vehicle is going to be limited out, perhaps, uh, on steeper slopes. For your color, too. Pardon me? For your color, too. There you go. We have had some conditions where we have married technologies. So if you take the hydraulic motors that we had on the wheel vehicles on these arms and you add what came out of agriculture, which was a hydraulic motor with a track base on it, and put that on each of the motors, you have essentially a track articulated tracked vehicle. And so this uh, felling uh, machine used in uh, uh, Austria is called the Snake. I'll show you a picture of it a little later when we talk about steep slopes. But it can articulate in this direction to go up fairly steep slopes. And it can articulate side to side uh, to some extent uh, by these articulated arms. And attractive force of what would have been wheels on a wheel machine is multiplied by the tractive efforts of tracks on each of these four uh, hydraulic engines. This type of vehicle is fairly recent development, but is uh, being used on some very steep slopes in Austria, Germany, and, and European countries. I saw it climb a 75% slope uh, on the edge of a road bank, and I measured it. Uh, uh, after he climbed up off there. He couldn't operate on 75%, but he could operate up to about 65%. And the operational uh, is made possible because both, uh, I don't think this particular one has it, but both the cab and the boom are self-leveling. So as the machine is at an angle like this, the cab sits up here and it levels itself as well. So you put all of the weight of the machine forward as opposed to tipping you over backwards. So it, it's a it was fairly impressive as a concept. And then uh, you saw the walking machine, uh, which is a, um, uh, a novel concept, a good idea, uh, great engineering technology, but has never become widely, widely used for a number of reasons. One is that when it's walking, where it could be rolling, it's going real slow. Uh, in the, diff the most difficult areas, it does fine as a felling machine. But you still have to come back behind it with some kind of a harvest uh, forwarder and remove the material. And that hasn't made it uh, possible as yet uh, to make that easier. 
this was actually actually developed for the peat bogs in Finland uh, because in those uh, areas the ground pressure is such that if you go there with too heavy a vehicle and you sink, you really sink. You go down like 12 feet when you break through that, that uh, frozen layer that's underneath the uh, uh, peak area and it, it's uh, uh, not possible to operate with other kinds of machines. This machine would have put such low ground pressure in different areas they could harvest the trees in there and uh, uh, they had some very wide track I mean, wide tired machines that they would bring through as forwarders and make one pass to pick them up. That's how, the, the, again, a lot of these concepts were single design concepts, not general concepts. But machine travel is critical. And of course, you could probably go way above everything. Uh, you could go uh, uh, above the, uh, the ground if you uh, had this kind of vehicle. This is a cyclocrane. Um, it had no uh, uh, real big engine to make it move. The rotation of these whirling blades at very slow motion had the Coriolis effect that propelled the whole thing forward. And the projections were that this would travel at 30 miles an hour carrying whole uh, truckloads of logs out of the forest. It turns out that it didn't exactly happen that way because the wind came up about like the wind that blew through Box Elder County last night, wrapped it around the mast at Tillamook, Oregon, and it never flew again. Uh, it was kind of a boondoggle. The real gist for developing was not for logging, it was uh, for the military. And the concept was that this type of vehicle or a similar one, the, the helistat, which also crashed, was going to be used to offload ships in the Persian Gulf directly onto sand dunes from uh, off the ship. It never panned out, of course. The helistat. Oh, there was helium in that bag. Yeah. yeah. So was that remote control? No, there was an operator thing. In it. Flew in that. Yeah, let's we'll go back. He's right in here. <laughs> we have we have a picture of them carrying a Volkswagen bus, a little film, a video carrying a Volkswagen bus around the site, uh, but didn't didn't uh, pan out. They made calculations too, just this technical feasibility stuff that comes into play, and uh, they measured the time it took to fly it these turns of logs and huge production rates, gigantic, but they didn't factor in acceleration and deceleration. And so to get the big turn of logs going up and getting it going fast enough uh, took over half the distance of, to the destination. And then they had to start decelerating to be able to control it at the end. And so revising their calculations, it came down by a factor of about 1 40th of what they had estimated. Our low transport is, is another uh, issue that comes into play. And it, again, we're just down to the business of do we drag the, the material on the ground with skidders as we typically have seen around here? Do we get it up on top of the, uh, the uh, machine uh, so that we're carrying the load in its entirety? Or do we carry a good uh, part of the load and drag the rest of it? And then you come into the notion of what size of loads do we have? These uh, clam bunk uh, forwarders and these much larger forwarders have very huge uh, load capacities compared to the smaller ones. Our typical uh, forwarder load is between 8 to 12 tons on the standard size forwarder, the 12 tons being the bigger one, 14 tons maybe. Uh, these uh, kinds of uh, vehicles, uh, this can be uh, 60 tons uh, on those loads of tree lengths. Uh, we get about uh, maybe about uh, uh, four or five tons on a skitter at most. And uh, these uh, forwarders can be fairly large as well. So it's how we transport the material that becomes critical. And there are different ways to, to do that. We also can do a table logging operation. Uh, this is a uh, 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 what's called a yoder. It is a hydraulic excavator outfitted with uh, uh, additional drums uh, so that it can, uh, when it's not operating as a cable logging operation, it has a boom here where it can load trucks and has grapples. With these special drums, we can form simple skyline systems so that we can uh, harvest areas where we can have a gravity outfall of the carriage, for example, and these drums will 
have the skyline, the carriage will go back and forth on the skyline, pulled in by the main line, and brought out by gravity. So this Yoder concept is one that's used quite a bit. It doesn't require uh, guy lines as long as we can keep the machine stable. And so we keep the machine stable by uh, running it up on a uh, log, perhaps, so that it's sitting back a bit, so that any kind of tipping force has to tip more of the machine in counterweight, or we just have a pretty good sized machine with a large counterweight. And for small material, uh, it, uh, it uh, works uh, perfectly fine uh, without much dialogue. The other uh, thing that we can do is shovel logging. And shovel logging is simply taking a purpose-built excavator out in the terrain and swinging the logs in sequential swings uh, to the landing. One person can move a lot of wood. We have such speed in the swing functions of the machines now that it is faster to shovel log a unit than it is to remove it with a skitter, a grapple skitter, or a grapple crawler tractor. And so that approach works very well, especially in clear cutting with tree length material. We can also shovel log in partial cut operations. You just have to be a lot more careful, as you might imagine. If it's too dense, too tight, you really can't shovel log very effectively. But that is probably the cheapest harvesting system we have in operation now. And that's why you see it replacing, for many of the industrial forestry operations, any kind of wheel, uh, wheel system if the timber is large enough. If the timber is small, it becomes necessary to aggregate the loads again. And that's why cut to length and aggregating loads to transport becomes more important. This is what we use out in Alaska in large materials, but it's absolutely amazing. You get three shovels in a row that just pass the logs over to the end. Yeah, or, or you can just do it in sequential loads. We, we uh, the, the place where this was developed was in, in uh, Washington State, out on the uh, uh, Olympic Peninsula, out of Aberdeen, Hoquiam. Uh, they were using it there uh, because they lost a cat in the swamp. <laughs> and uh, they got a little wet ground out there. They lost the cat, so they brought in a shovel, pulled the cat out, and while he was there, he started swinging logs after they got the cat and found out that he could stay above the terrain and could swing logs fast enough. The fellow's name was Pete Pappick and pretty soon it became shovel logging. And we can do about three swings economically. You can do four if the, if the terrain will allow it. But even on some very broken terrain, we can use shovel logging because we'll put a couple of logs up and down the slopes and we'll go in from the bottom and throw the logs onto that uh, kind of like a brow log and it'll just roll and put a hell of a pile of logs down there. You can go from the top of the slope and throw it down the slope and uh, move a lot of wood. Uh, with a shovel. Across between the, sh the skyline logging operation, the, sh the Yoder operation, is uh, tong tossing machines. And that's what we have shown here. He's, uh, this is an, another grappled uh, uh, track vehicle pulling the logs away. But this machine has a device on it uh, that has a line and a winch that you see right here that with particular skill, the operator can toss the tongs, if they're using tongs, up to about 400 feet, uh, and the uh, tongs then can be attached to the logs. They can reel them in just like a fishing pole and uh, drop them at the landing. Uh, you don't have to use tongs. You can use, they use a weighted ball and chokers at times as well. And you can set chokers on the logs, preset them so that you have while the logs are going to the landing, you could be setting the other chokers and stuff. We take some real skill uh, to be a tong tossing operator, to be sure. But we're having more trouble finding the tong catchers <laughs> because that uh, has some <laughs> elements. Uh, uh, these guys get pretty good, so it, 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 surprisingly, it has a very good safety record. That system I ever saw is where the tong setter and the operator switched them to a yeah. mutual respect. Yeah, that's right. You know, it's, it's, there's always an I got you period coming if you get a little too... Uh, plus, it's hard work. I mean, setting tongs is, is hard work. So that... Uh, and the thing I just wanted to point out is that even with this kind of technology that seems fairly brutal, this shovel logging and stuff, throwing the logs, how can that be efficient? 
We have concepts like radio control chokers. We don't have to put anybody into this mess right here. We can use a choker that is set in the woods uh, that is released by pushing a button from the cab of the machine. So self-releasing chokers or radio control chokers are part of that concept. Load transport for biomass can be a variety of different things. We don't have the answers down for this entirely. Uh, the Nordic countries uh, sometimes will will look at uh, collecting it up and then dumping it in another bin. This is this dump system that you see here. A lot of energy, a lot of iron. Or some place, places they have used uh, mobile chippers uh, blowing into a small uh, uh, bin on a converted skitter. Those concepts are used uh, periodically. But I don't think we have the answers just yet. One of the uh, more promising uh, uh, stuff uh, we'll see a little later in transport is the use of the technologies developed from garbage haul, where when you have this 20-yard uh, 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 bin put at your house for, for debris, the ability of that truck to pick that up and put it on itself has some appeal for biomass harvesting. Some experiments are underway in Montana that makes it work. At the landing, we process it in a number of ways. We can look at stroke delimmers, uh, processing it into a bin where the top goes directly into a bin. We can look at stroke delimmers just producing logs, which is what they more typically do. This is a pull-through delimmer so that you have a shovel there that pulls it through uh, the operation. And then you can also have these that are, that are motorized so that it pulls it through itself by feed rolls and processes it at the limit. So you have several approaches to, to scale. And in addition, we have dangle head processors, which are like the uh, uh, single grip harvester heads that we have on the felling machines, only we put them on a hydraulic excavator. And they will measure the log and uh, uh, cut it off at the desired length and process it appropriately. The dangle head processors can have a big circular saw head in them, or they can have a arm, uh, a, a, a saw bar uh, cutting processing. So we can process at the landing. And we can do some kind of a chipping hog fuel combination as well at the landing. The loading and hauling uh, comes into play as well. Uh, here are some of these uh, garbage bins on a uh, truck uh, that are, that are uh, loaded. Here's a truck that has loaded itself with a single uh, garbage bin. Uh, multiple trailers uh, are possible with these uh, uh, small logs. That's typical of the Nordic countries. You have usually a three. This one has four 16-foot uh, logs along the truck, loaded by the truck itself. And for some places, we have off-highway hauling. You can do tree link operations. For chipping, we use our chip vans that are part of that. And then this is the one which uh, has uh, some appeal now in that we could not just use biomass with these set out uh, self-loading bunks. We could use it for handling some very small wood. And you can see these are preloaded uh, out in the uh, woods by a forwarder, dropped off at the landing. Then uh, the truck uh, comes in, uh, loads uh, himself, or the truck can come in and load a trailer <coughs> as well and have a truck and trailer combination loaded by this technology of, of what we learned from the people who went to your garbage. And that has uh, some appeal both for biomass as well as for, for some very small wood efficiencies in handling. Well, if they're empty, you can stack them. Oh. Yep, yep. Several. Well, take a look at this stack. This is what the Nordic countries are looking for. They would like to have 80-ton uh, 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 loads on their roads. And uh, I think you would find some opposition to that among your rural residents in most of Utah and other places. But it shows the concept that, that you really need to be looking at as much load capacity as you can. And some of these uh, 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 Nordic highways are built to handle such loads because they do it for their freight hauling as well. And uh, all they have to do is to make sure they connect up with, uh, with their off-highway road systems for their industrial lands without traveling through the roads that aren't meant to handle it. 
I mean, you can't even take this truck through one of those uh, Swedish cities. There's just no way. But that's where they're, they're thinking about offering. At, at a central processing yard, you've got all kinds of options. Uh, the typical one is to roll it out and to, to cut it into lengths by a chainsaw uh, and with some good uh, instructions for, for bucking. Uh, other ones, uh, you can come in with uh, a uh, processing head. Other times, they'll have a tray uh, where the whole logs will come up on the tray and it'll be like the end feed to a sawmill, except the logs will be redistributed uh, from that operation. So yard operations are possible. More often than not, people are trying to get away from the extra handling. If we can program the computer processor of a single grip harvester with a value set that would be equivalent to what we would get in a mill and do the processing in the woods, we save a lot of materials handling. I think it would depend on how many sorts you're dealing with, too. Um, again, my experience up in Alaska, our company had about nine or ten different sorts, and you had to have a yard just yep. to kill them. Yeah, and the size of wood that comes into play as well. Anytime we're doing this, it's a piece by piece operation. Anytime you handle a piece, so if you handle a piece that's uh, 12 inches in diameter versus one that's 24 inches in diameter, it isn't just doubling of cost that goes up with the square of that diameter. So that 24 inch piece is much less expensive to handle than that 12 inch piece. It's the, pizza pie concept, you know, you don't order two 12-inchers uh, when you go to the pizza <laughs> pie. But that's the concept of yard operations. Overall, there's a place for all of the systems and the machines depending upon the characteristics. You know, everything from balloons to helicopters all have their role uh, at a particular point in time. Cable systems are still a part of the western uh, environment where we have steep slopes that are long. Uh, other technologies are just now at the verge of uh, of coming on that may not let us operate on steep slopes with uh, tracked vehicles or wheeled vehicles. Any questions about uh, the machines that uh, operate in our system? Yeah. Silvicultural systems, uh, you know, you, you, you've shown some examples of thinnings as opposed to clear cuts, things like that. But, you know, how do you evaluate that with the machine that's part of Well, uh, there's a couple of uh, issues. Uh, resource damage is one of those, and that comes into play that we'll specifically talk about. That uh, wheeled, three-wheeled machine uh, is a very effective machine for cutting trees and putting them in piles, small diameter trees. But it is terrible for damage to the residual stand because the operator can't see behind it. And the little trees uh, don't give him enough of a bump back to where he knows that he's running into them. And so when we went to a site where we had a, what looked like a good thinning job looking from the road, if you went back to the end of the unit and looked back, he went, ah! because all of the trees were damaged on the back side where he had run into them. And so that part plays into it. The other part is that long logs uh, don't work very well in thinnings. And so that's why we've looked at more of the cut to length systems for thinnings and dense stands where we can break the trees down uh, sooner uh, into lengths that we can handle and manipulate easier. Uh, we gain efficiencies if we can handle pieces all at once, uh, and let's say in the case of shovel logging, take that uh, whole stem to the landing with us, that top end, if it remains intact, would be a good biomass material, but we've got to get it to the landing uh, eventually. We can't just go out with a, a, a forwarder and pick up that one lone piece. So it depends on our tree density concepts as well as uh, the uh, end products that we've got that makes those systems work. Almost any system can be made to work, uh, but some just work a whole lot better. And some are, are uh, just not really suitable for tight thinning operations, I would say. And small wood is the other part of it. We'll have to rethink some of our silvicultural systems if we get into biomass because there are concepts that we haven't seen here that are swath harvesters that will take out just a swath of material and that leaves the trees free to grow on the other each side of that swath still very dense in the middle of it uh, but you get some release and the Canadians are doing a lot of that in Alberta and Calgary uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan well I think it's uh, probably a good time to take a break because uh, I think you're your, uh, your uh, surprises here, so let's take a break then.